All right, I think it's uh, time we, we get, get going. Um, welcome, everyone, uh, to, to today's webinar. My name is Ian Scarrett from the uh, Eclipse Foundation. We are pleased to have James Brannigan from Band 11 and Tiziano Modotti from Eurotech talking about the anatomy of an M2M application. The Eclipse Foundation is doing a series of webinars about M2M and, and the M2M open source projects that are being developed at Eclipse. This is a series. Of, this is the second in the series of four webinars. Um, the next two webinars will be about MQTT and the, the Eclipse Paho project, followed by a webinar on Lua and the, the Eclipse Kaneki project. So I hope you will attend um, as many as your as many as possible. All the webinars are being recorded, so you'll be able to view them um, at a later time. For this webinar, we'll have time for questions and answers at the end. So as, you go, as we go through this, feel free to ask questions in, in the chat pod or in the question area, and we'll take the questions um, near the end. Um, but now, without further delay, I'd like to turn it over to James and Tiziano to talk about the anatomy of an MDM application. Over to you guys. Thanks, Ian. As Ian said, my name is James Brannigan. I'm a partner at Band 11. International. Um, we're a small software company that specializes in M to M applications um, operations and also doing services around that. And I'll let Tiziano say a little bit about uh, his role at Eurotech and what they do there. Hello, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are located. Um, my name is Tiziano Modotti. I'm a product manager for Eurotech. I'm located in Italy. Eurotech is a, an embedded company developing embedded system for uh, different markets like uh, transportation, industrial, and defense. Um, in my role, I'm looking after the software offer of Eurotech uh, that includes embedded application framework and machine-to-machine -machine integration. Okay. Great. So we'll get started now. Um, so this is the description slide um, that was sent out with the advertisement for the webinar. This webinar will be a little bit deeper technically than the first one, um, and it will talk about how some of the technical pieces fit together um, all the way down from the sensors and actuators up through to the server and the enterprise or cloud systems. Um, we expect that many developers that are attending this webinar will know in great depth some section of this. Um, one of the interesting challenges of M to M is that it spans such a wide area. There are very few people that are are deep in all the areas, so we thought an overview would be very helpful. So this is a picture that I like to use um, when describing M to M: the blind man and the elephant. Which um, there's a poem about it. There's quite a bit of discussion about the the origins of this um, this story, but the basic idea is. Um, a lot of different people who can't see are touching different parts of the elephant and trying to describe what it is. And each of them think it's something different based on whichever part they're, they're uh, touching. And this is a lot like M to M, because if your experience with an M to M app is on the enterprise side, it feels one way to you. And if your experience is down writing device drivers for sensors, it feels completely differently. What we hope to do today is just describe the anatomy of the M to M app, kind of give names to the different pieces and roughly describe how those different pieces fit together so that at the end of the webinar, our hope is that you'll have some idea of what the general shape of an M to M app looks like and also how the pieces fit together. So what are the bones of a specific M to M application that we're going to cover today? Um, there's sensors, sensor buses, connectivity methods, uh, actuators, the actuator buses and connectivity methods, and this is really how the data gets in from the physical world and how you control the physical world. There's a wide range of remote devices and ways to connect those remote devices back to a cloud or an enterprise, so we'll cover some of those. We'll get into the idea of embedded device frameworks and embedded device applications. This is software that runs on those computing platforms out in the real world. We'll talk a little bit about communication protocols and how you route data from the physical world into the enterprise or the cloud. We'll talk about some of the challenges of data storage and data query that m to m presents when compared with the traditional enterprise app. We'll discuss worker processes and adapters to other parts of the enterprise that may already exist. And then we'll discuss uh, end user web interfaces interfaces to mobile devices and uh, remote device management, which is a key aspect of any M2M system. 
So without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Tiziano and he'll get started from the sensors working his way towards the server. James, um, I just cannot go. OK, fine. Thank you. So let's start from a simple definition of, of a sensor. So a sensor is a converter that measures a physical quantity and converts this quantity into a signal which can be read by an electronic instrument or, more interesting for us, a system that in this case is an embedded system. And to make a simple analogy uh, with the human anatomy, the sensor are like the fingertips of our hand. And um, I know that some of this information might be very obvious for, for all of you guys. But here is a list of the common sensor used. So we might have acoust acoustic sensor, vibration sensor, uh, temperature, humidity, current flow, optical sensor as well. So also a web camera uh, is, is a sensor. And of course, we can have mechanical sensors. And many other sensors are uh, definitely um, on the field. So part of this is just a, a subsection of what we can find on the field. OK, sensor, sensors basically communicate using many different buses or interfaces. We may find wired sensors that are using a very simple one-wire interface. Or we can go over many different two-wires or four-wires interface. Uh, we definitely face the majority of the sensors using serial ports. Uh, we are starting to see USB sensors, Ethernet sensor, and of course, art sensor in the oil and gas industry. But there is a huge variety of sensors out there. Of course, there are sensors that are communicating using wireless protocols. And uh, many. one of the most popular is basically ZigBee that is built on top of the 802.15.4. Of course, we find Bluetooth sensors, Wi-Fi sensors, and many other proprietary protocols. And of course, to insist on the anatomy comparison, the sensor buses are like the nerves There are many sensor communication protocols. And uh, definitely, in order to acquire data from this sensor, we have to adapt to their language. In this case, we are calling about protocols. In the field, we can find protocols like SEE J1939 that is very popular in the automotive market, where it's used in vehicle diagnostic applications. We find protocols like Modbus very popular in the industrial environment. We find uh, protocols like NMEA that is used for acquiring uh, geographical information coming from uh, GPS. And in this category, I also included uh, RFID and Continua as a couple of examples of different protocols that can be found in the field. The conclusion of this is that, at the end, each sensor has its own protocol. And in order to acquire information from the field, we need to be capable of talking the language of the sensor. In the field, we also have actuators. Uh, an actuator, just a simple definition, is a mechanism by which an agent acts upon an environment. And again, to make a comparison with the human anatomy, the actuators are like muscles. Again, a simple list um, of actuators. We have pneumatic actuators, hydraulic pistons, relays, and piezoelectric actuators. And many others can be definitely faced. So again, actuators. Uh, are communicating using many different buses or interfaces. We have 
uh, cable interfaces using one wire, two wires, four wires, serial USB Ethernet interfaces, and we also find a wireless sensor using 802.15.4, ZigBee, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, or wireless proprietary protocols. Again, a variety of interfaces uh, can be used. Uh, we have digital output for basically controlling relays, analog output for controlling uh, actuators or like motors. We have, we have Modbus for uh, talking about with an actuator, of course, ART and many other protocols. And again, each sensor, sorry, actuator has its own protocol. So the next piece of uh, the next slide is is about remote devices, and remote devices are the core are at the core of distributed system. A remote device represents a device that is spread into an area that may be a region, a continent, or uh, to be very simple, just the floor of a building, and performs basic functions like data acquisition, data computation, and data delivery. A remote device in our in the machine to machine is typically an electronic system that is capable of acquiring data from the sensor, act to, through an actuator, or elaborate or compute the information, and finally is capable to send the information to a remote server. For the sake of simplicity, uh, we can consider just to divide the machine to machine devices in two big categories. So the first category is what we call single purpose, single service remote devices. We are talking about typically devices that, in that are constrained in terms of uh, computational resources. So they are using very simple and very cost effective processors. And in this case, uh, in order to program these devices, an embedded approach is uh, mandatory because the, there is not too much computational power, the memory is constrained. And these are categories that basically are typically addressing one purpose. So they are basically capable of doing one action. Uh, this is not general, but just to simplify all the discussion. And of course, an optimization of the code is necessary. In the next slide, we are going to see a simple representation of a single service gateway, basically uh, acquiring information from a single sensor and sending the information to the remote server. And again, uh, the, the, the idea of this picture is to stress the concept that the single service is capable of talking just with a single sen sensor and sending the information to the remote server. The opposite approach is what is called multi-purpose, multi-service, machine-to-machine devices. In this case, we are talking about a system that is capable of running and acquiring many different information from many different interfaces that basically, instead of having the lower cost per device, is providing the lowest cost per service, and in which the Computational power is actually a little bit higher than the previous example. So we can typically run uh, Java and OSGI frameworks on these devices. And where an IT-centric approach is mandatory, where basically the, the possibility of developing an application is, should be more easy. In this slide, we are basically uh, depicting the concept in which the multi-service gateway is capable of acquiring data from many different sensors, and might be that all the sensors are using different protocols, is capable of talking with legacy systems, and is also capable, of course, to send information to a remote server.
So a remote connectivity methods. Uh, by definition, and a remote device is capable of communicating information. Who is going to receive the information? Or how this information gets transmitted vary a lot. So it depends on many different aspects of the application. Regarding the transmission of information using uh, basically cable to simplify, there are, we consider three big categories and we have the, the most popular one is what is called Ethernet or technically speaking we are calling about, we are talking about twisted pairs. We also have uh, some legacy application using coaxial cable and in the future we, we are going to see, we are already seeing optical fiber as the way of transmitting a lot of information. Of course, we are also using other different medias like uh, wireless communication and in the modern machine-to-machine -machine application we identify the following wireless communication categories like satellite communication. Cellular is what we consider the most popular one and uh, here in Europe we have uh, GPRS uh, while in US we have all the other categories um, like CDMA, 3G, 3.5G and right now is emerging LTE. Of course we also have Wi-Fi uh, that may be uh, also using mesh technology or ad hoc Wi-Fi connection. So at this point uh, we've basically described uh, the, the different kind of way of acquiring information from the field and the different media that can be used for sending information to a remote server. Basically right now we need to develop the application on the embedded device and what is actually helping a lot is the use of device framework that are used in order to simplify the application development on the embedded slash remote device. The embedded device framework, they typically provide um, four categories of abstraction. Is one that should help to acquire information from the field or from the sensor. Another one that is, should be capable of abstracting the hardware, providing application segregation, and also to provide a remote connectivity um, as a standard feature of an embedded device framework. So the first part is about sensor abstraction. And as we said before, there are many different sensors that are basically uh, providing many different protocols. And one of the key of developing machine to machine is application. Uh, that are related to machine to machine is the capability of abstracting from the the single protocol and concentrating on the logical data values. So the one of the main role of an embedded device framework is to abstract the protocol in order to have the machine to machine application basically developing the business logic instead of coding the single protocol. So there is another part that is basically related with the communication. Uh, I consider this an internal communication. So for example, if you want to develop an application that uses uh, a cellular modem, you know that all the uh, cellular manufacturers are basically providing a standard set of AT commands that are actually slightly different one from each other. So one of the the, the important things that a, the communication framework has to do is to abstract from the single manufacturer implementation. So the embedded device frameworks uh, have to provide an abstracted interface for communication over a given channel. In this case, it might be the channel of communication with the cellular modem. So basically, the details of the the, the protocol has to be 
included and isolated in the embedded device framework. So another important aspect of a, an embedded device framework is to provide the capability of managing the devices on the field. So typical operation that has to be performed on the devices on the field are uh, firmware upgrade, application upgrade, uh, might be also a upgrade, or the capability of applying security patches. And typically this is accomplished uh, by including an administration client on the embedded device framework that can help in all of these operations. So the other piece is about the application. And typically machine-to-machine -machine application um, solves a specific problem for the customer. And that's the reason why you, you need to abstract from the single sensor and you need to concentrate on the business logic. So just a very simple example of an application is a local geofence. So these are the steps that the application has to perform and we, we need to read the position from the GPS. We need to compare the position against the loaded geofences. And of course we need to apply the business logic. So if the boundary is crossing is detected, we need to send a notification to a remote server. And of course we need to be capable of refreshing the loaded geofences. So just from this single, just looking at this simple application, uh, we might consider that there is there there are a lot of peculiarities. Like the GPS uh, might be different from one vendor to the other. Uh, there might be different remote servers, and that's the reason why the the embedded application framework has to provide us an abstraction from the sensor and of course from the remote server. So these are uh, at an high level the operations that we have to perform. We have to read value from sensor. We need to write values to actuators. We need to execute a local logic or local analytics. We need to provide data logging. We need to provide the operator the capability of controlling the device. We need to be capable of uh, generating alert and notification is something uh, basically happens. And of course, we need to be capable of sending data use it to a remote server. So on the application framework, uh, there are many different technologies uh, that you can find on the market. And for example, we can use C and C++ for developing device driver at the OS level. We can use Lua, Java, C Sharp for developing the application level code. Then we can use HTML, CSS, JavaScript for designing and basically providing operator, local operator interfaces. And uh, there are many different other uh, protocols. And of course, MQTT is a protocol that is used for sending messages to remote servers. So now I'd like to pass the stage to um, James for the rest of the slide. Thanks. Thanks, Tiziana. So I'm going to pick it up from um, a message has now left the embedded device, and we're headed into the enterprise or the cloud. Um, and typically, this communication is going to happen over TCP or UDP. Um, there are different trade-offs depending on if you're using satellite or cellular, a private VPN on cellular, or the public internet. Um, so the, the actual protocol varies kind of application application at that lower level. Um, then at the next level, you say, well, protocols like MQTT and HTTP provide a higher level of abstraction, and these are very desirable for the applications to actually communicate in. Um, one of the th reasons that we don't just use HTTP everywhere 
is because MQTT lends itself to handling unsolicited device events much more cleanly. What I mean by this is if the device notices some condition and it wants to make the server aware of it, with MQTT it, there's a very straightforward way for it to send that message. With HTTP you would have to um, perform an operation from the client and wait for the response from the server, but then that would make it difficult from the server side to then send unsolicited configuration changes down to the device. So no matter which side you would make the server, this, you know, the enterprise cloud side or the remote device side, you end up in a situation where there's one type of event you want to send on. An analogy I like to use is that MQTT is a push model and HTTP is a pull model. And what I mean by that is with HTTP, you do a request, you pull the response back to yourself. With MQTT, you can push up the information you need to say. So this is the galactic um, slide for the enterprise side. Um, I'll leave this up for just a second. But we're going to talk through some of these um, at a very, very quick pace. These are some of the different bones, if you will, of the um, of the M2M -M application on the server side. So you see the VPN up at the top. Um, that's API that you do things, generate reports, you run workers against that. Um, the device management makes use of that API as well as the mobile and web uh, backends. And you can see you can send alerts out and you also need to interact with the cellular carrier APIs and do things like uh, fraud detection and data usage reporting. Some of those workers will run M2M application logic in addition to communicating with other enterprise systems to do analytics, electronic data interchange, and various business processes. There's quite a lot going on here, and we're going to go through it fairly quickly so we have some time for questions at the end. So we'll start with VPNs. Um, typically, if you're doing a cellular M2M &M system, you want to set up a virtual private network for those SIM cards that are reporting data to your server or set of servers. And the, the main reason you want to do this is you want to make sure that you're the only ones communicating together so that you're not having someone trying to talk to your device um, or spoof protocol messages. Or in hardware VPN solutions available depending on what kind of scale you need to achieve. So there's a couple different models we're going to uh, mention here. Um, the simplistic model is basically the queue in the database. So the data arrives over the VPN. It's immediately saved into the database for safekeeping. And then there are worker processes that run queries against that data store, parsing and validating those new messages and effectively moving it through a state diagram um, in the database as it uh, processes each message. A slightly more uh, sophisticated model is to use a broker model, um, and these are called message brokers. A lot of the big IT vendors have products, and there's also an open source uh, broker that talks to MQTT called Mosquito. Um, so in this model, a message arrives from the client, typically over MQTT at the broker. Interested parties subscribe by a topic subscription, which can have wildcard pattern matching. The broker compares the incoming message to the subscriptions that it's aware of and notifies the subscribers that match the pattern. This is a nice uh, feature because it allows for an event-driven programming model for those workers. There are some downsides, but we're not going to have time to get into that whole discussion today. Another way that data gets back to the, the enterprise or the cloud is through uh, what we call sneaker nets, and these are data transmission by human carrier. Um, these days what that means is typically somebody with a USB thumb drive. Um, and sneaker nets are very useful when you need to get bulk data off of a remote device. That might be too costly to send over satellite or cellular. Um, so these can be very 
important for developers that are trying to debug issues in the field um, in getting these logs in. So M2M is all about collecting the data to analyze and, and actually do things with. Um, the, there are different challenges with how you transmit and how you store the data, um, both on device and to get it to the cloud, um, and how you move it between the different servers because the volume of data can actually be tremendous. It can be into the, the terabytes um, very, very quickly. Query performance typically dictates further splitting of the data in, in the enterprise and cloud side so that you keep um, one set of the data that is effectively your operational store that you need to, to perform whatever the business logic is that the system is fulfilling. And then older data or less important data gets pushed into a data warehouse where it can be used by other processes that aren't as time critical. On-device storage is often used, um, and I'll tie, tie this on-device storage into the enterprise here in just a second, as a cache when connectivity is spotty, if you, especially if you have moving assets and you have a cellular or satellite connection. You're going to have periods of time where you can't maintain connectivity to the back end. Um, this leads you to build in capability to upload that cache data after the fact for a, a period of time in the past. Um, also, with on-device storage, you'll often store some additional information that you don't send over the link, and this is, again, the diag typically diagnostic or developer log data that you may want to get um, through another channel at a later time for improving your system. On the enterprise and cloud side, you're going to typically store this data. Um, there's a couple different ways people are doing it. One is with a traditional kind of object relational mapping model on relational databases. And there's another set of newer systems that are using um, the resource description framework or the semantic web, a NoSQL store, or a graph store um, for storing the data in the cloud. Um, as I mentioned before, they typically set this into two different groups. One is the operational set that's needed to, to run the application day to day, and one is the data warehouse set. One of the key things is the data warehouse has to be able to handle cache data arriving after the fact. What this means is each data server or the cloud, and one is the um, the time of the event or the actualized time. Um, queries on the enterprise and cloud side need to be very aware of this and make sure they use the right timestamp for what they're trying to accomplish. One of the things that's interesting here is that um, because of these different timestamps and also the fact that you need to keep history of things like location reports or sensor values or actions performed against the device, the database design um, or your schema effectively ends up looking a lot like a general purpose version control system. So there's a couple interesting things to keep in mind if you're an enterprise architect and you're dealing with an M2M system. Um, one of them is that the lifespan of some of these remote devices may be many times greater than the lifespan of a, a popular programming language. So when you choose a data model that is going to work on the embedded device framework side as well as the enterprise side, you want to avoid data models that are tied to a specific hot technology and go with something that's a little um, a little more programming language neutral because it's likely that the language that you would have picked 20, day, 20 years ago um, isn't so popular today um, if you had deployed a device 20 years ago. So you want to keep that in mind. Another thing is these devices do break and get replaced and oftentimes the feature set of the new model will change over time, meaning different sensors are to adapt to a mix devices that are fulfilling the same basic capabilities and some of them have additional capabilities on top of that. This pushes your design towards a, a more simple and flexible schema um, over a very detailed and ornate model that exactly ma matches the problem description at the time of the initial deployment. So worker processing is one of the key things that happens and again this can happen by um, guys running with their own thread and queries or it can happen through an event-driven model. Um, 
what you want to do is quickly get the important data stored in the database because you never know when the system might crash, especially if you're running in the cloud. And then you want to perform queries to find your relevant inputs to your work and then write your outputs back to the data store again so that the next level of processing can find that and keep, keep working. One of the design patterns that we typically use is only put the most business critical alert detection on that incoming data flow. If you allow the entire application to be done in that event-driven programming model, you can actually end up with really long event chains um, that can take a long time for things to happen. So we only do the most, most critical things that really would kill the business case if they are not detected immediately on that incoming data channel. Um, we use algorithms as a, a type of worker um, that does some processing of the sensor input and makes it into a more consumable input for someone else typically by generating some output. Just a very generic term, but it, it's some piece of code that runs in the server environment that processes the raw inputs coming from those embedded devices and turns them into something slightly more useful. And you may have many layers of these algorithms to produce your final result. A simple example is going back to the geofence um, example, but on the server side. So here we're going to receive incoming location data from the remote device. We're going to compare that against known geofences and generate an entered or exit event, which we're going to store back to the data store. Another worker is going to be running, and they're looking for entered and exit events in the, geo, in the data store as their inputs. And what they do when they detect them is they actually perform a transfer of a bill of lading over an enterprise uh, data exchange system. So in this way, you can integrate a legacy system you may already have with an EDI interface with an M2M -M system based on some event calculated by an algorithm. And this is an example of the sorts of uh, connectivity and integration that you can perform on the enterprise side with M2M -M apps. So moving along here, because i got a few slides to get through in not too many minutes, so we have questions left. Um, one of the key responsibilities on both the device side and the server side is to generate alerts and notifications and make human operators aware of potential problems in the field. Um, there's a lot of different paths that are used, email gateways, SMS gateways, and more recently, um, gateways to do push notifications to either Android or iOS devices have become very popular. So you can get it right to the operator's phone as quickly as possible, no matter where they are. Again, just design philosophy here, critical events should hook the incoming data flow, um, but not too much else. The rest you should get into the database as quickly as you can and run that as a worker process. Um, typically, we like to have notifications enqueued and managed by a separate uh, worker process so that we can get back to handling the incoming data as quickly as possible, but we know that there's someone, there's, a, there's another process that's responsible for sending those notifications as quickly as possible. One of the key components of any back-end M2M system is the health monitoring. Um, as you saw in that very first chart, there are many different pieces of an M2M system, and they're performing many different functions. And so simply knowing that those servers are up isn't sufficient level of monitoring to know that the application is actually working properly. You need to have a system that can collect details from all the different parts of the processing chain, aggregate that data, um, detect problems with the overall flow, places where it's stalled, and be able to use the notification worker that we just talked about to send either email, SMS, or mobile push notifications to your IT staff to get the system operating again when something's gone wrong, especially when you're running in a cloud uh, environment where you're buying your IT time from someone else. This is very, very important. Enterprise adapters are another type of worker, and they're typically um, involved in getting data from the M2M -M system that's collected from these devices or outputs of algorithms that run over that input data and getting that into other systems. Um, could be an analytic system like a SAS or a Cognos. It could be an electronic data interchange system, which is used in many different industries for exchanging information between each other. It could be an internal business process system. Some inter
and each of these need access to specific shapes of the M2M -M data to do their job, which again is another reason to keep a, a very simple, flexible schema. Um, typically they're running as periodic processes, and again, one of the things you don't want to do is hook the incoming data flow to do this sort of work um, because you'll really bog down the system. There's a, now we'll talk just a little bit about some of the other interfaces very quickly. So the m to system provides some operational task typically in addition to integrating with various enterprise parts of the business. Um, and one of the most common things people are doing these days is making a web interface for the operators and not trying to make a thick client to talk to the m to system. So here you find your standard web technologies being used to develop the, the web interface. And you typically will run that on a separate server environment, and you'll have some API that you develop between your web UI server and your m to m server. Um, this is important because the scaling functions for the two different um, interfaces are very different. The web UI scales based on the number of users actually using the system, and the m to m system scales based on the number of devices reporting data. So you don't want to tie these two together because you can need to over-provision the system that way. Mobile interfaces uh, have quite a lot in common um, with web interfaces, but they also handle some tasks that are very specific to mobile, which is why we break them out separately typically. There's a lot of demand um, in the industry for people to be able to see this data on either their um, tablet or their phone, and that is includes both apps that may talk in to this mobile backend, so apps from the Android Marketplace or the, the iTunes App Store, um, in addition to uh, mobile browsers. And so there's a lot of startups that are focused on the task of making it easy to, to write a backend for a mobile app, because a lot of the mobile app companies are not server experts. And they typically focus on things like access control, push notifications, unique identifications, um, permissions on the mobile device, and they deal with all the churn in the different SDKs from Android and iOS. So just like the web interface, we use a similar design pattern. We have an API between the mobile backend and the M2M -M backend. Um, this, there's a couple reasons. First, we have the different scale, just like we mentioned with the, the web, but also the mobile changes extremely rapidly, and we don't want that churn to be um, causing us to have to continually change the M2M -M backend. And uh, one of the last pieces of our bones here is the device management, and this is critically important to the overall operation of the system. You need to be able to push out updates, um, security updates, new feature functions, um, operating system updates, configuration parameter changes for who they should communicate to or various other settings. Um, if you have to send someone out in the field to do these updates, you can kill the return on investment of a typical project. So there's several options, but there are many other options that people use in this industry. It's far from set. So what I want to finish up with before we take questions here is just telling you a little bit about what Eclipse M2M -M projects are up to and how they relate to the different bones um, of anatomy of an m to m app that we just discussed. So there's the m to m portal link you see here at the top of the screen, where you can get some basic information on all the three projects below, Paho, Mahini, and Kaneki. And each of those have a wiki, and you can see the links on the screen for each of those projects. Paho is interested in providing open source implementations of open and standard messaging protocols, um, particularly MQTT, which is an open protocol and it's working towards standardization. So at Eclipse, open source clients and different programming languages are being created that allow you to talk MQTT to a server. And MQTT was designed from the very beginning to be very, very bit efficient. So it's a cellular and satellite friendly protocol for you to use when you're communicating to the server. Mahini is interested in developing and delivering an embedded runtime running on top of Linux 
that exposes a high-level Lua API for building M2M applications. The key points here, are it's a reference design for building M2M applications using the Konecki tools and the PAHO protocols. So you can think of it as an example or a, a recipe for you to take inspiration for for your own M2M application. And it's intended to work on reference boards so that you know that it's real and it's not just something that only will work on a laptop. The Konecki project provides tools for easing the development, testing, and simulation of M2M solutions. Some of the key uh, components of the Konecki project are an a set of tools that allow you to estimate your protocol data usage so you can get a good idea of how you can actually um, modify sensor values and, and be able to test your device. And then includes Lua development suite for Eclipse that adds Lua language development capabilities to, uh, to Eclipse. And that's the main components of Konecki. One other thing that the M2M group is doing is they're actually hosting the Mosquito Broker um, running in a sandbox up at Eclipse at M2M Eclipse slash sandbox. You can learn more. And this allows you to connect your remote devices and verify connectivity over MQTT um, without having to set up the whole server infrastructure. So it's a nice way for you to be able to get started and kick the tires um, right, from, right from the beginning. So now we'd like to open it up to questions. I think Ian's going to put them in order for us. Yep, yep. Thank, thank you, James. Um, so we've got some questions come, come in that, that we'll go through, but if you do have any questions, now, now is the time to, to get them in. The first question is, um, is TCP a must for MQTT on the server side? James, can you, can you take that? MQ, so MQTT can work over a variety of transport protocols. Um, however, on the on the server side, I'd be interested to know what they what the the question asking um, what alternatives they would suggest because that is primarily I would say the ninety five percent case is going to be MQTT on TCP on the server side. Okay, so if, if people want to um, do a follow up, you just just put it on the ask in, in the chat. Um, the next question is, does M2M define implement concerned, is concerned also with downstreams to the sensor actuators, for example, to send commands? I'm not sure if you can parse that or not. Certainly, I'll, I'll take a pass at it. So okay. certainly application logic does send commands from the server down to the embedded device, which then will um, perform whatever protocol actions are necessary on the actuator to cause it to interact with the physical world. It's a, that's a very normal use case. Um, so an example that we talk about in the working group is the, a refrigerator example where the server environment may change the set point of the refrigeration unit and that data flows down to the embedded device which actually causes the temperature of the refrigerator to change over time. Okay. Um, actually, a follow-up for the TCP question. Um, the alternative would be UDP. Can can you use MQTT over UDP? I believe you can, but I would need to um, check with some of the MQTT experts. That would be a good question for next week's webinar. Yeah, actually, yeah, I was going to bring that up too. The, the next week we're doing a webinar just on MQTT, so we will have some hardcore MQTT experts available then. You could also um, ask it on the, the PAHO mailing list. I'm sure you'd get a quick answer there too. Um, going on to another question. Does the future of M2M um, have intelligent sensors actuators that don't need a gateway and connect directly to the cloud enterprise? Or is this not the objective of M2M? So I guess kind of how important is the gateway or can you connect directly into the cloud enterprise? So I, in, in my opinion, um, that scenario that's described there is more of one of the dedicated devices getting smart enough to talk on its own. 
Um, the, the point of the gateway is that you can perform many different functions against many different sensors. Um, if you want to do something without the gateway, you're basically talking about making your dedicated sensor uh, smart enough and capable enough to perform actions over a cellular network or satellite link or whatever the transmission link is to, to send the, the sensor data that way. So it's certainly possible. I don't know um, if the economics will push things in that way or not. Tiziano, do you, do you have anything to add? Yeah. yeah, I just want to comment on it. I guess uh, on the market there are sensors that are already so intelligent they can talk straight to the cloud using uh, protocols like MQTT. Uh, for example, there are on the market uh, passenger counting sensors that are capable of an Ethernet connection so they can go straight to the cloud. So this is another uh, kind of application that I consider within the machine-to-machine -machine umbrella. Okay, great. Um, going on to the next question, is there a recommended approach on how to map data onto the MQTT layer? Again, this might be a better question for next week, but James or Tiziano, do you, do you have a, an opinion on that, like a recommended approach? I, I'll make just a brief comment. Um, MQT, my analogy of MQTT to HTTP with the push and the pull, um, MQTT uses topics and HTTP uses URLs. But as you, if anyone familiar with the web development has seen, there's a RESTful style and a SOAP style that have developed as ways to use HTTP. There are similar uh, design competitions in terms of preferred ways of using MQTT and defining your topics um, that exist in HTTP. So you have more of a RESTful style of topic usage and more of a SOAP style of topic usage in MQTT. Okay. So there's there's no single answer there. There's a competition between different styles. Right. Um, going on to the next question, isn't it a bottleneck when all the MQTT messages go through a central service broker? Does anyone? I'll, I'll take it. Okay. Uh, of course, the the, the broker has. Um, since it runs on a server, um, might end up in basically ending the bandwidth. Uh, but definitely there are implementation on the market that are basically uh, assuring that the broker is going to scale and so you can basically push as much as information you want on a single broker. And behind the single broker there would be another set of brokers that will take care of the data. Yeah, so so I, there's certainly a kind of a scalability and reliability architecture that needs to be put in place for, for the brokers, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, last question, so if, if other people have questions, um, please uh, feel free to get them in uh, soon. Um, are there competitive or protocols to MQTT? So what, what, what else is out there besides MQTT? A lot of what I've seen in the projects I've um, been aware of have been designed by the project itself. Um, so they've been effectively homegrown solutions to solve some of the problems that MQTT solves, but not necessarily as well. Um, Tiziana might be familiar with some other competitors. Yeah, I guess there are many, um, let me say, proprietary protocols uh, out there. Um, Probably MQTT is one of the, uh, the popular one and is also open. Uh, but definitely there are other competitors. I can just mention, um, of course, proprietary implementation over HTTP. And I would say that's it for my knowledge. That might be a good question for next week also, Ian. Sure. But, but I think in general, kind of my observation of the market is that as you said, James, a lot of people just do it themselves, do their own protocol for a specific application. And that's where kind of MGM or Internet of Things is starting to fall apart, right, is you don't get the interoperability because each application is so siloed. Um, and so having a common protocol that can be used across applications is, is really the vision that we're trying to promote with uh, the Eclipse Working Group, the MGM Working Group. 
Absolutely, and, and that interface between the, the devices and the server is the critical, one of the critical points to, to have a standard interface that gives you that flexibility. Yeah. Okay, last call for, for questions. Um, we're, we're getting to the top of the hour, and so we'll, we'll finish it up if there's, if there's nothing else. Okay, I don't see anything else coming in. Um, so thank you, uh, James and Tiziano. Uh, next week we are having a, a presentation on MQTT, very technical, very specific to MQTT. So if you're interested, please uh, uh, sign up. Again, I will send a link to the registration form for that. As I said, this is recorded. The presentation is recorded. I will send out a link to, to everyone um, to the recording. It usually takes a day or two to get the recording posted. Um, but thank you again, and thank you uh, uh, to our presenters. Have a good day. Thanks. Bye.